Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven talk radio that promotes happiness from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights trendsetters and change agents who offer sound emotional fitness tips for improving mental muscle tone and greater well-being. Guest experts include a diverse and proactive collection of the greatest thinkers and doers who are devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology coach, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in the fields of sustainable happiness, mindfulness, and positive lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio, broadcasting consciously prepared brain food from the beaches of Malibu, California. Each week, we explore the very serious business of happiness, sustainable well-being, and human flourishing. We are not talking about the annoying yellow smiley face. Mm -mm -mm. We are talking about something much deeper and critical to the success of humanity. Authentic happiness is not selfish, egotistical, or narcissistic. In fact, it is essential in order for humankind to thrive. Sustainable happiness is important because it not only elevates our own well-being locally, but also contributes to collective global flourishing. The achievement of a happy life is not only positively good for us, it is constructively good for those around us. In short, happiness matters. Happiness comes from the heart. And this show is most definitely all about the heart. And today's show is extremely interesting and stay with me here because you're going to see how it connects back to happiness. The topic is science help and the exploration of temptation, willpower, and compassion and how science relates to them. And I am particularly interested in this subject because so much of what I teach and coach people is about cultivating greater self-mastery and the art of delayed gratification. And without further ado, I would love to bring on our guest, Dr. Kelly McGonigal, who is a health psychologist and lecturer at Stanford University and a leading expert in the new field of science help. She is passionate about translating cutting-edge research from psychology, neuroscience, and medicine into practical strategies for health, happiness, and personal success. Her most recent book, The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Control Works, Why It Matters, and What You Can Do to Get More of It, explores the latest research on motivation and temptation, as well as what it takes to transform habits, persevere at challenges, and make a successful change. Good morning, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Oh, it is a pleasure. And I love how our two uh, areas of interest and expertise dovetail in one, into one another because it is the integration of all of this science and what's going on in the world of science right now is so relevant to real, the real life world and putting these practices and strategies that you write about and talk about as well as I into action. Absolutely. And even just in the introduction to the show, which I was hearing for the first time, I, I heard so many words that I think of as being critical to uh, to the work that I do as well. This idea of choice, that positive states like happiness can be cultivated like a strength. Yes. Uh, the the um, idea of looking for happiness that is sustainable and that contributes to common humanity. I and mean, these are these are all things that I care about as well. So it's really a pleasure to be here and talk about these things with you. Well, I am thrilled for you to be here. I heard you speak, and I can't remember where it was, and I said to Kelly St. Clair, our producer, who did a rock star job of tracking you down, I said, we got to get this lady on the show because she <laughs> is, you know, you are the cutting edge of science. And what I love is people People often relate happiness as the, as the soft parts of life, the mushy parts of our character and emotions, when in fact there is uh, compelling evidence in the scientific community. That happiness really, that there is a science to it, A, positive psychology, of course, is, is the exploration of that, but also what happens in our brains when we experience or create positive emotion. Yes, absolutely. 
And, you know, I, one of the things I love with the work that you're doing is about temptation and willpower. So let's just jump into the subject of temptation. We've all experienced it, no matter how much we tell ourselves in the world that we have fabulous discipline. It's bunk. We can't be 100% perfect all of the time. This is true. And, I, you know, I should backtrack a little bit and talk uh, maybe a bit about why I'm so interested in experiences like temptation. Because, you know, as someone who is trained in positive psychology, um, it is very tempting to focus on the positive states, things like willpower and self-control, uh, maybe to focus on resilience instead of the actual experience of stress and trauma. And one of the things that I've discovered and, and has really informed my approach to using science as a source of help is how important it is to understand the two sides of human nature and to understand the sides of ourselves that, that might be considered the shadow side as, as an actual way of cultivating the positive states and strengths that are also part of human nature. And so one of the reasons that I got so interested in, in the science of temptation is because so many people were reporting to me that they felt like that experience was getting in the way of reaching their goals, uh, whether it was the goal to lose weight or to form um, healthy relationships uh, or to have success at work. And when people were talking about the experience of temptation, they seemed to feel that it said something about what was uniquely weak and wrong with them, that people were interpreting their own experience of temptation or distraction or stress and overwhelm maybe their own behaviors of procrastination, they were interpreting that as being a, a kind of a readout on their own moral virtue and character and, and coming to the conclusion that they were inadequate and broken. And so I wanted to look at the science of temptation and things like distraction and procrastination as a way to help people understand that, that these are fundamental to the experience of being human and that you can have all of those experiences and still reach your goals and still find strength and, and still um, turn your energy and attention to the things that matter most to you, even when it's difficult. And so that's really how I got started in this area of, like, you know, why look at what's happening in the brain when people are tempted as a, a kind of a source of self-compassion that lets us move forward. Oh, I love what you just said about a source of self-compassion because we are so hard on ourselves. You know, when we don't achieve our goals or we don't hit the mark of performance levels that we set for ourselves or for one another and, and then, uh, judgment comes up and all these other, other emotions. Um, but the idea about self-compassion and what you just mentioned about also exploring sort of the darker sides of ourselves, the darker sides of human nature as a catalyst for actually training to bring out the best in ourselves. You know, that it's working by re uh, the inversion theory, that the happiness mm -hmm. actually comes as a byproduct in reverse. Yes, absolutely. I mean, even if you look at uh, at other aspects of psychology, I mean, one of the ways that we know how the brain works is we started by studying people who had brain injuries uh, and, and sort of reverse engineering how the brain works when it's healthy. I feel like in our own lives, um, often that is one of the best strategies for figuring out how to overcome old habits or, or get unstuck from a rut that you feel like you're in is to actually develop a kind of curiosity and, uh, and self-compassionate attitude towards understanding how things are happening the way they are now. What is the process like of putting something off that you really do care about? Um, what is the experience like of losing your temper when you really want to be a, a sort of a calmer parent or a calmer partner? And to be willing to really look at that uh, rather than jump right ahead to think, well, this is what I want and I'm just going to, I'm going to implement something positive. And I, I do feel like when you take both approaches to understanding how things go, go wrong, so to speak, uh, and it's the attitude that you bring to that process of self-observation that makes all the difference in the world. Because as soon as you start to watch yourself, you know, fall down the, fall down the hole of whatever it is, um, as soon as you add to it any, any element of shame or self-criticism, um, it will only reinforce the pattern that we're trying to understand and ultimately transform. Well, you bring up an interesting point about being the neutral observer of self. You know, that's what comes to mind as you describe this, that if um, we are able to train ourselves to observe what's going on, not just with the good and celebrate it and add a girl ourselves and each other, but when things go wrong, to not assign the judgment, to be able to be quite neutral in the observation and then say, what can I learn from this and how can I train to be better? 
Yes. And so, as you know, I'm trained in both science and, uh, and mindfulness meditation. And I feel like this is an attitude or a mindset that you can gain from either one of those fields. You can think of yourself as a, a scientist who is observing without judgment, but just with true curiosity you know, observing how your own mind works, how your environment might trigger certain behaviors and, uh, and taking a look at what supports you as well as what sabotages you. Um, but we also can learn that skill from things like mindfulness meditation, where, you know, you can actually cultivate as a, a skill, the ability to observe what's happening without the usual automatic habit of immediately assigning blame or self-criticism or trying to, what many of us do is, um, deny how we might be contributing to our own suffering because it, it's so easy to fall into self-blame and self-judgment that we don't really want to see it. And if we can't see it, it makes it very difficult to change. We are going to be going to a break soon, and I, but I want to touch upon t- two words came to mind as you were just speaking, and we will we can pick these up after the break, and that is needless suffering and story. You know, the mm. story that we tell ourselves that keeps us stuck or keeps perpetuating the unhappiness that we say we want to end or avoid. And um, I mean, I see this a lot in the work that I do with veterans. I run a nonprofit where we use positive psychology, coaching, mindfulness training, and yoga. So we integrate the brain, the, the breath, and the body into combat trauma recovery. And, you know, oftentimes they'll say, the, the soldiers will say, you know, we just want the suffering to end. And we don't want to um, feel this bad anymore. And then it becomes um, deconstructing what the suffering is and helping them rebuild a new uh, model or story for the life that they want to lead. So it's very mission-driven and proactive, but at the same time, not bypassing the emotions. Yeah, so let's talk about that after the break. Yes, let's talk about that after the break because that is probably a whole, sh- a whole show unto itself. And I'd like to give our listeners more information of where they can find you and the work that you're doing. And that is at kellymcgonigal.com. I'd like to spell that. It's K-E-L-L-Y-M-C-G-O-N-I-G-A-L.com. On Twitter, she's Kelly McGonigal. And on Facebook, she is Kelly McGonigal Author. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. We'll be right back after this quick break. Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if? Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are we happy yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, I'm here today with Dr. Kelly McGonigal, who is a health psychologist and lecturer at Stanford University and a leading expert in the new field of science help. She is also the author of The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Control Works, Why It Matters, and What You Can Do to Get More of It. And prior to the break, we sort of were touching on the subjects of temptation, willpower, compassion, self-compassion, and the needless suffering 
and stories that we tell ourselves that keep ourselves stuck. And by needless suffering, I'm not uh, talking about suffering that is part of the human condition, the suffering that each of us will go through just by the fact that we are alive, but the perpetual suffering that goes on when we become stuck and unable to break habits um, or cycles that bring us happiness and pain. So, Kelly, let's let's carry on here because I know you have a lot more to say about this than I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, and I actually, something that you said before the break um, really inspired me to talk a little bit about this idea of suffering and, and what kind of suffering we can choose to avoid and the kind of suffering that we actually can't avoid. And um, one of the things you had mentioned is that your veterans get to this place where they say, we just don't want the suffering anymore. And I find that that is such a common report from people who are suffering from not just trauma, but addiction, depression, and anxiety, uh, and binge eating, and, and all the, the things that are um, such common struggles, human struggles, uh, that people say, I just don't want to feel this way anymore. Like, I can't take the inner experience of addiction or anxiety or trauma. And one of the things that has really fascinated me coming out of the latest science of suffering is that um, when you start from the assumption or the goal of getting rid of the inner experiences that, that are related to suffering, it actually reinforces the suffering and leads to a kind of rebound state. So if I'm somebody who suffers from anxiety and I want to transform that experience and, and find courage and the ability to approach the things I want, um, if I believe that I need to get rid of the inner experience of anxiety, the heart palpitations, maybe the thoughts that predict all the terrible things that are going to go wrong if I try, if I think I have to get rid of that first, that inner experience of anxiety, I'm almost guaranteed to, to not only fail in getting rid of them, but to have increased anxiety and continued um failure to, to, to do the things that I care about. And this has been shown for every possible type of suffering, whether you're somebody who thinks you need to get rid of cravings before you can lose weight or before you can resist something that you are addicted to, or you feel like you need to block out intrusive memories when you're dealing with PTSD. And um, again and again, the research suggests that we need to accept these difficult inner experiences as as kind of passing events in the mind and body that we do not have control over. When it comes to self-control, whether or not we have a thought and whether or not we have an emotion or a physical sensation, that is actually not the thing that is under our control. And so a big part of when I think about um, helping people be free from unnecessary suffering, it's kind of a paradox, but the place I often start is helping people understand that they, that they don't need to and frankly can't control the aspect of suffering that most of us think we, we need to get rid of, that we need to uh, overcome in order to change the overall experience of suffering in our lives. Well, you know, it, it, it makes me think of, you know, the acceptance of events that you were saying and also about not being able to control these emotions as they come. But when we reframe the experience of those emotions as like, like the waves, for example, that yes. they're going to come in and they're going to come out. And it's one thing that we know for sure because those are the laws of nature. But how we relate to those waves when they come in, the choices that we make that, um, surround how we respond is I, from my perspective and what I've witnessed and how I teach, where the power lies. Yes. And in fact, one of the things that I think of as being the first way to relieve unnecessary suffering is actually to help people develop a kind of self-trust that mm -hmm. they, can, they can handle the experience as it comes up. So much of the unnecessary suffering that we experience comes from the, the sort of a fundamental mistrust of ourselves and our ability to handle difficult inner experiences, to think, I cannot handle this physical pain, so I need to get drunk. Or I cannot handle this anxiety, so I'm never going to leave the house. And um, and one of the best ways to start to relieve suffering is to actually give people the skills to recognize um, that I'm not going to explode. I'm not going to spontaneously combust. I'm not going to fall <laughs> apart. I, I'm, I'm not going to die from this pain in this moment. And to teach skills for being with the inner experiences that normally we would be so reactive to and so afraid of that we engage in all sorts of um, self-destructive behaviors to try to protect ourselves from them. 
Well, the, the, the fear of, of going there, you know, to that, that dark place uh, is also tied up in not being able to control oneself and return from it. So whether it's, you know, the fear of uh, being in such a sad or grief stricken place that you'll never come back. And that is a myth. It, it, you know, it is a, it, it is not a self-fulfilling prophecy. It really is a myth that if you go there, if one allows themselves that extreme vulnerability, one also opens up the pathways for that extreme joy as well. It is. It's true. And it comes back to that quality of mindfulness we were talking about, mm-hmm. that there actually is a way to observe um, these emotions and thoughts with with a kind of clarity. But also, I want to say, I mean, even when we talk about these these habits of mind that are unhelpful, uh, we can even bring self-compassion to looking at those habits of mind. And when I think about the human tendency to protect ourselves from our own grief, to not want to look at the anger or the fear or the, the craving, there there is something kind of sweet about it. And to recognize that even in, in this habit of mind that tends to end up being destructive, to recognize that even in that, there is the seed of yourself trying to take care of yourself. Because I think one of the hardest things when you're working with people who suffer from things like addiction or trauma is helping people make contact with that part of themselves that really, truly does care about themselves and is going to be available to mentor themselves um, in the process of change. And this is where... um in my opinion, the soul comes in. You know, we often, it, it, within within the medicine community, medical community and science community, there it can be a, um, a disconnect between that very soulful parts of ourselves. For example, when you take a, a warrior who's come home from, from battle and they are challenged by post-traumatic stress, you know, it, it, we label it a disorder. We tell them that there is something wrong. It's a disorder. Well, actually, it's the very natural order of things. You know, they've been exposed to extreme stress, extremely violent, traumatic circumstances, and to not be affected would actually um, create the red flag or the uh uh-oh to me. So it is like you say that, 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 that parts of themselves that are looking to take care of the soul or the heart or their own spirit without sounding woo woo, because I'm not intending it to be that way. No, I understand completely. And I feel like this is how science, you know, we're talking about spirit, but uh, sort of ironically, this is where science becomes this tremendous source of self-compassion because you can take someone who's suffering from PTSD and you can say, you know what? This is how the stress system evolved to protect you. And this is what happens in your body when you experience great trauma. And this is how the chemicals reshape what's happening in the brain as a way of trying to help you deal with similar situations in the future. And although it's causing stress and suffering now, to understand that this is this is evidence of normal functioning in you and that, again, it doesn't reveal anything that is fundamentally broken about who you are. And now the job is to um, to trust the brain and the body's plasticity and that if it learned from trauma, you can also now learn from positive experiences that you'll be creating in your life in, in a place of safety. Well, let's talk a little bit about the plasticity of the brain because the, the, this may be a new word to some of our listeners, the idea uh, that we can actually reshape what's going on within our heads. Yeah. So many of us understand this at the level of the body, and so I often think it's helpful to start there. Um, you could take a look at your own bicep and you know how big your bicep is and what it can do is in large part determined by how often you lift heavy things. And if you wanted to make your bicep bigger and more efficient, if you wanted to make it easier to lift heavy things, all you really have to do is start picking up heavy things. And as you get stronger, keep picking up heavier things. And what you do creates the shape of the muscle and the skill of the muscle. And we didn't know this until pretty recently in the last decade or so. But the brain is a lot more like a muscle of the body than many people uh, appreciate, that it is constantly reshaping itself. Uh, to to get better at the things you ask it to do. And so if you you know spend all day long being self-critical, you're actually going to develop a brain that is really good at self-criticism. <laughs> if you do if you do math all day, your brain is going to get highly efficient at mathematical reasoning. If you cultivate if you choose to cultivate gratitude, you're going to get a brain that is really good at recognizing positive things in your life and remembering to express 
that gratitude and appreciation. Uh, and the brain literally gets bigger and better connected in a way that, like the bicep, is going to make it easier to do certain things um, and to kind of prime you to think and feel and behave in a certain way. And so a big part of all the work that I do is helping people think about what's the workout that's going to help create the brain that you want. Um, and part of that is understanding the brain that you have, whether you're talking about trauma and how that might have affected the brain or looking at how, um, you know, in, in any sort of addiction, even if it's just spending too much money at the mall or having a hard time resisting dessert, that how your brain may be primed to seek those rewards and what the workout is for um, resisting that temptation and choosing to focus on longer-term rewards. And there's always a workout for whatever state it is that you want to cultivate as a skill or a trait. You know, I love that you say workout, but it is, it's very true and, and actually stupidly simple. It's the execution where we have the complications. <laughs> you know, that we all know that if we want to become thinner, we shut our mouths and start moving our feet. So where is that disconnect that happens between the rational mind and then the temptation that creeps in and um, sabotages our efforts? Um, we are coming to an end, and I want to make sure that we talk about the Center for Compassion and your work at Stanford. And please share, because you're involved with some wonderful work up there. So this is the Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and we're a multidisciplinary institute uh, that's actually in the Institute of Translational Neuroscience, which is basically that means how do we apply neuroscience to actually help people? And um, one of the things that we're very interested in is looking at whether compassion and self-compassion are trainable attitudes and mental states. And we're using compassion meditation and mindfulness meditation to do that. We recently published um, our first report of this intervention in the Journal of Happiness Studies, showing that this eight-week training in compassion and self-compassion really does help increase compassion for others and for ourselves. And um, we are continuing to find that not only does it increase compassion, but that when our compassion increases, we also become less anxious, uh, less depressed, more connected to others. And so um, my work at Stanford is basically helping to continue to develop this intervention and teach it and investigate uh, its benefits. And I'm hoping that eventually we'll be rolling this out as a program that can be taught in schools and in hospitals and other settings. This is incredible work. Um, is there information on your website that would link um, listeners to the Center for Compassion, or should we give another domain yes. for that? So there is, but if people want to go there directly, the website is CCARE, C-C-A-R-E, dot Stanford, dot E-D-U. Perfect. And I'm going to give our contact information for you once again, because we are running out of time to learn more about Dr. Kelly McGonigal and her work as a health psychologist and lecturer at Stanford University. Please visit kellymcgonigal.com and that's K-E-L-L-Y-M-C-G-O-N-I-G-A-L.com. On Twitter, she's Kelly McGonigal. On Facebook, Kelly is Kelly McGonigal author and her book is The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Control how self-control works, why it matters, and what you can do to get more of it. Thank you, Kelly, so much for being on the show with me this hour. And I hope you'll come back again in a few months and update us <laughs> I with sure what will. you're doing. It would really be fabulous. Nothing gives happiness like a free gift. Unwrap your present by signing up for Happiness Headlines, our monthly e-zine at harvestinghappiness.com. Stay tuned for more after the break. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and sometimes we all need support. We all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstance. Sure, things will inevitably happen in our lives that are out of our control. There is only ever one thing that is totally within our control, ourselves. When we have command of ourselves, we are better prepared to handle life and bounce back more quickly when challenges arise. Whether you see the glass as half empty or half full, the glass has the capacity to hold more. You have the capacity to be happier. The tool to harvesting your happiness is within your grasp. Are we happy yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com.
Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life, and at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at harvestinghappiness.com. We are talking about peak performance through sports and training, the inner game of self-mastery. And my guest today is the master of that. Timothy Galway is the founder of The Inner Game and is widely acknowledged as the godfather of the current coaching movement. Tim developed The Inner Game in the mid-1970s, and he has spent decades inspiring successful organizations, including long-term clients such as Apple, AT&T, the Coca-Cola Company, and Rolls-Royce, with whom he shared The Inner Game of Leadership, Sales, Change, management, and teamwork. Tim is also a best-selling author. His book, Inner Games, or the Inner Games series, set forth a new methodology for coaching and development of personal and professional excellence in a variety of fields. His books have led many to realize that the inner game holds the key to the outer game of their lives. Amen and welcome, Tim. Well, I, I'm excited to... Uh, be focused on the inner rather than the usual focus. How does the inner help your outer game? Yeah. Well, the, the inner is um, is the seed of everything, right? The inner experience. That's not what our society at large is believing. They want, oh, you have to get less stress in order to succeed in the outer game. You have to handle your doubts. You have to learn how to concentrate. But there is there's a game that we've been playing since our first breath. And the big word for it is evolution. And happiness is its goal. So I am delighted not to have to talk about selling uh, and winning your next tennis match. <laughs> I love that. And you know what? You're in good company because selling is, is something that um, I prefer not to do. You know, I prefer much more in the being. And 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 what come come what may you know. You you can't sell a person what they already have. That's true. And if we're talking about the ability uh, to actualize happiness, well-being, life satisfaction, or dominion over oneself, we it's already there. It's already there. Exactly. It's like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. She had to go on this whole adventure. And then she realized all she had to do was click her heels to get home. Well, let's click. <laughs> what made you? You uh, you were a professional athlete. No, it, it, I was. Uh, uh, as a junior player, I was number seven in the country. Uh, I was captain of the Harvard tennis team, but I entered the career of education and uh, on sabbatical I started teaching tennis because I realized how many obstacles stood in the way of education really educated. So I started doing what was done unto me, teaching Tennis, take your racket back early, hit the ball in front of you, hit the ball in the middle of the racket, follow through. All our education is wrapped around two words, should and shouldn't. And what that does, I suddenly, well, what happened to me one day in the tennis court the student 
bless his heart, started to break his bad habit before I started teaching. Do you realize the calamity that that was? He was learning without me. <laughs> he was undermining the economy of tennis. First I teach, then you learn, then you pay me. And that inner dialogue shocked me. And I said, I wonder how much learning can take place with how little teaching. And what I found out was 500% more. And so the instructions went out the door and what came in was simple awareness of what you were doing. And with that awareness, we began learning as the best learners in the world do, all of them being under five. And how easily we learn how to walk and talk without being told how. And when we're told how, we get self-judgmental, we get self-doubt, can we do it? We're trying to please the pro and the observer instead of enjoy inherently the learning and growing process. So that's true in whether you're playing an outer game like tennis or business, or whether you're playing an inner game like fulfillment, joy, happiness, uh, peace, all of those realities happen within the human being. Yet the society we live in is 90% or more concerned with how we're doing in the outer game. Oh. And when we can master that inner game, and I, what I hear you saying is mastering it through the eyes and experience of that childlike wonder that each one of us possesses no matter how old we are. Absolutely. We start seminars asking people, and your audience might just do this mentally, what are the qualities that you most admire in any child under five? And you will get strings of curiosity, fearlessness, courage, wanting to know, wanting to discover, having fun in everything they do, uh, learning not being afraid to ask, they were designed to evolve and we get uh, subjected to, well, external goals. Yeah. And what others will think of us. And what others think of us, not like Socrates said, know thyself. It's, it's fundamental and ignored. We yeah. don't know our obstacles. We don't know our potentialities as human beings. And I'm so glad there's someone like yourself and there are others who are saying, no, guys, Inner comes first, yeah, and outer will follow. And there are millions of rich people who are poor in inner prosperity, in their happiness, in their joy, in their gratitude for being alive. And I want to reverse that. 
that the privilege of being having being alive on this planet and being able to be happy, being able to appreciate, to be able to be grateful are so rich and it can happen to happens to poor people. <laughs> poor <laughs> externally. So it's not dependent. You know, we need a house, we need food, we need water, and we need air, but we definitely need peace, we need happiness within us. You know, it's funny you, well, it's not funny, it's so true what you just mentioned about uh, poor people or people who have less uh, monetary reward they are not necessarily unhappy people. I had the great fortune a few weeks ago of going to Havana, Cuba to speak at a, the Latin continent, continent um, psychology conference. And there were 1,500 psychologists that had come from around Latin America and the Caribbean world and, and Europe and the Middle East. And the focus was really on the human condition. But one thing I really was acutely aware of within the Cubans was the fact that although they didn't have a lot, they were extremely happy and they were very articulate about this, very aware of what they, what they didn't have and the riches they did have. We, we can learn a lot from them. I spent, I talked and uh, made a few trips to India and the poverty needs to improve external poverty but the internal richness is staggering and we we have a lot to learn we do you and i are going to need to volley off to a very brief break to learn Uh more about tim galway's work please visit theinnergame.com on twitter that handle is at the underscore inner game and on facebook the page is tim galway and that's g-a-l-l-w-e-y here come the tunes who says money can't buy happiness check out lisa's new book are we happy yet eight keys to unlocking a joyful life and other fun fashionable and inspiring items at shop happy at harvesting happiness.com we'll be right back after this quick break Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if? Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are We Happy Yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life, and at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast. Why? It's kind, it's free, it's legal, it's available 24-7, and we're talking about peak performance through sports and training and the inner game of self-mastery with my first guest today, Tim Galway. Tim, before the break, we were talking about cultures such as Cuba and India, where they don't have a lot of money or seemingly abundant resources, and yet the people there are happy. They possess a level of inner well-being and contentment that we don't see as often in the Western world. I'd just like to correct that they're not all happy. 
No, of course you not. You can not be all. unhappy and externally rich. You can be unhappy and externally poor. They're two different things, and we have we have happiness in us, and we have depression and anxiety and fear. But the one thing we have is human choice. It's one thing that enables us to pick and seek the happiness which goes way beyond good mood, goes way beyond cheerfulness. We have begun, just we're in kindergarten <laughs> in the inner, <laughs> inner game. And uh, we're liable, we're so distracted even by sports and business and performance because performance can be seen and then they can say, you're wonderful. We need to know how wonderful we are by our experience of those potentialities we have for happiness. It's what we're here for. You talk about uh, the new economy. Talk yes. About, share well, this. I just made this up, but you talk about the economy and it's time and talent given in exchange for external wealth that you can put in a bank. And that's what the game is. And there's a whole other dimension, which is called inner prosperity. The growing of your talents, the growing of your happiness, the knowing of who you are. All this, the seeds of this wealth is within us. A little bit of nourishment a little bit of focus, a little bit belief that it's already there. And we would not worry so much if we lost a few dollars from our bank account because we're, we're looking out there for what's already inside us. Yeah. This is, uh, this is a discovery that many of us make on our human journeys, that we, we seek s- so much validation from external sources, be, albeit our careers, our relationships. And don't m- mistake that the relationships are exceedingly important. The interconnectivity is key. But what you say is so true, that the inner resources, the, the inner light, the relationship with the self is where we find the sustainable parts of our happiness and well-being. It, it actually it actually has no limit in in time or extent. A good example, you go to work and the boss says you're here to do a job, right? How common, how axiomatic is that? And you really should, you can't get away with it, say to the boss, "Uh, sir, I already have a full-time job. (laughs) Yes. I've had it since I was very, very young, and I'm going to have it till my last breath. And let's just say it's to enjoy the gift of this life to appreciate it, to be happy in it. And I hope this job that I'm asking you for will pull, will challenge me to go beyond where I am on the inside. I am the job being done. And the people I work with are the job being done while we do our job. That is, in my mind, the correct priority. And we're, 
the organization will do better, but the people who work together will have a chance at fulfilling themselves. And that's such a big shift. And so I invite all listeners who would like to be a part of that to give me a, a be in touch. I've worked for 40 years on this and we're beginning to take it all to a new level. So just give me an email at inner Tim Galway, G A L L W E Y, at gmail.com. And yes, there are books. Uh, the tennis book I was told would sell 20,000 because that's how big. The tennis market is, but it sold. It's already sold a million and a half. It's still number one on Amazon, and that's because it's not about tennis. Yes, <laughs> the tennis gets better, but what do you learn while you're playing tennis besides tennis, or what can you learn? or in whatever you do. We're here to evolve, and we can do it in whatever we do. And that's fulfilling. The other we need for the roof over our head and to put food in our family's life, and hopefully we do that out of love. But it's much more exciting to play both games at the same time, to integrate, to marry the inner with the outer instead of pretending life is about external success. Yeah. I want to ask you, uh, because I think our listeners may be saying, all right, Tim, what you say makes perfect sense, but how? How do I begin to take that first step? How do I begin to change my habits? How do I um, muster the courage to stretch myself? Well, inner game means the potential for happiness is there, and so is the interference. So you have to be willing to face the fear, to face the self-doubt, to protect yourself, to think for yourself, to discover your own heart and believe in it rather than whatever comes to you through the television channels and the indoctrination that we all have. I wish I had time for a little example. Um, the tennis coach says, hit the ball in front of you. And the inner game coach says, uh, Joanne, where is your racket meeting the ball? Ah, uh, I and see. Th that's the whole thing. Awareness instead of should. And should happens as a result of awareness, as a result of trust in your own capability to learn and grow, and being clear that your goal is not just to win, but is to thrive. Yeah. You know, just as you were talking, I'm thinking about when we talk about change, I guess we look at where is our energy meeting our intention. Absolutely. And we, we live in a world that has it focused out there and how we look. But what counts is how we feel in our heart, in our being, for the privilege to be the one thing we all are which is alive. 
And every breath is a gift that enables you to have the chance to explore what happiness really is. Which is the antithesis of what we're taught. Yes, except as children. Except we're, as children, we're, it's we're, acceptable. We're happy doing whatever we do. We play games. We get shot in cops and robbers. And we die an agonizing death because it's so much fun and we're dealing with our fear of our mortality. It's children have fun and learn in everything they do. And then we go to school. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then the pilot light is, is dimmed. <laughs> and we get taught. You know what I want to say in ending is when we think of authority, we think of it being out there. Governments, experts, scientists. We all have inner authority. We are CEOs of the success or failure of one life. I challenge you to say that's not more difficult than making a company profitable. We're all CEOs of our life, and we need to accept the authority that we will find in us. Now, Hemingway said, Hemingway said, if you want to be a good writer, learn the difference between, can I say it, bullshit and clarity. <laughs> and, and write the clarity. And we have to do that inside ourselves thank you tim galway to learn more about tim and his amazing work please visit the inner game.com on twitter at the underscore inner game and on facebook that page is tim galway g-a-l-l-w-e-y tim will you come back and share more of your your joy with us well i've enjoyed this time so Next time, I expect we'll be even better. We have flown through another hour of purpose-driven media designed to inspire you, our listeners, to create more joy in your lives and within your communities. And here are a few thoughts before we part. Happiness is not a destination. It cannot be bought, sold, or traded. Happiness will never invite you to the party. It simply comes down to a choice to show up each and every day in the world with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. This is Lisa cypress Cayman, and my guest today, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Go out and rock your day. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Join us each and every Wednesday for a brand new episode of consciously curated talk radio from the heart. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime from the comfort of wherever you are with hundreds of free downloadable podcasts from our libraries on Tokinet, iTunes, and SoundCloud. In a complicated world seemingly driven by nonstop negative news, Lisa's mission is to celebrate the upside of life and seek the silver lining of our challenges by transforming them into uplifting growth opportunities for all. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.